for Monday, April or June third, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Present. Councilman McCrotts. Present. Councilman Taylor. Present. Councilman Papstrap. Present. Councilman Mazza. Present. President Scanlon. Present. All seven here. Okay. Up first is Jerry and Steve Carson, RL 112. So these are the this is the mayor's annual proposed budget. This is for fiscal year 45 CDBG home ESG funding. Um, not asking for this to be expedited, so uh, by the next work session we'll have as well in the munis format that needs to be passed as part of the, you know, for the passive budget. The city council will pass it, it'll be included in the 2020 budget. Um, typically, I think with this, uh, I kind of go through any uh, major differences with the CDAC recommended budget, which I know the city council had a presentation on uh, last month. Um, I will say that, you know, as in previous years, uh, ESG has remained um, uh, same. Uh, we have a slight <coughs> change for home, but those entitlements are we generally follow the CDAC recommendations. Um, so if you'd like, I'll, I'll kind of go from the top down and discuss some of the differences and then uh, answer any questions that you have this morning. So in the administration and planning aspect, uh, lockstep with um, uh, lock up with CDC, thousand dollar change in, in fair housing based on previous uh, bills for that. Uh, economic development, housing and code enforcement, again, lock step with CDAC. And as we move into the community development programming, we have a couple of increases in public infrastructure improvements and parks improvements, uh, slight reduction in home purchase assistance and repairs. Uh, it was a big jump that the CDAC took in. Uh, we just didn't feel that was a, we felt that it was a little bit too much of uh, a jump. On board with the lead risk assessment, having funding available. Uh, we viewed the, the homeless capital improvements. Uh, we had this year human services capital set aside, so we felt that that was duplicative. Um, we will be doing outreach to ensure that the, any homeless service providers also have an ability and, and are aware of the human uh, services capital set aside competitive grant program. Uh, certainly good news with the Section 108 loan. I think everyone's aware of that. Um, traffic safety improvements will uh, incorporate within public infrastructure. Gives us a little bit more uh, broad scope with that funding. Um, we're leaving 85000 for the Senior Home Repair Program. This is the first year that we're doing it with First Board Action Council as a bump up from 35000 they used to have. So we want to you know, give it a full year. I think it's a great program and I can see us boosting in the future. We just want to be through a year before we start throwing a significant more money at it. Uh, demolition blight, blight removal, capital program set aside all the same. Uh, we have a line item for the Northside Child Grocery Store. It's part of the city's $150,000 uh, support for that project in terms of capital funding. Uh, and leave human services capital set aside and ownership academy uh, the same. Uh, moving to public service programming, <coughs> before we begin, I'll, I'll let Steve explain and be very clear when it comes to the public service cap and why these activities are split off in categories. We have community development program and we have public services. There's a hard cap on these. Um, we're slightly below the cap, but in terms of adding additional tens of thousands of dollars, it just would not be, be viable. We have our cap at 289,000. Steve, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's, it's set at 15% of your, your overall budget. Um, the issue with funding at the cap is that if all the other expenses are not expended properly and your service money is spent, then when you do your calculation for your reporting, you'll be over percentage-wise because you do a snapshot of time for every time you do your report. So if for some reason, let's say, not very many roads are built or we don't do a bunch of demolitions, but all the human service funds are used, then when we go, we may be at 20%. So HUD's response typically with this, if you exceed the cap, is that the general funds, you have to pay it back, uh, the difference. So you can't 
angle to the cat, but it's dangerous. It's always a good idea to err on the side of caution. So um, in the uh, public service programming, well, we did boost from fiscal year 44, human services up another roughly 15,000, uh, uh, reduced from the CDAC recommendation. Um, OT, uh, park rangers, same as last year. Uh, we do have a line item as with the opioid addiction recovery of 45,000. The 50,000 to support the um, after hours program at the Boys and Girls Club. This has been a program we found uh, previous year's money in past years. And I think it's a really worthy one that we'd like to add to the budget to ensure that uh, the fund will be available. Um, so that is is the CEVG portion of the budget. Um, I can answer any questions regarding CEVG. Want to go to those questions? Council Taylor. Thank you. Yeah, just um, the thirty grand for security cameras. Is that? Uh, it's my understanding there was a discussion about the location of those at the CEAC. Is, is that going to be earmarked for a specific area? Uh, not here. Uh, it can be earmarked uh, if, if everybody wants it to be. It has to be done in a Lomont residential area. So, for example, downtown would not qualify. Um, it has to be a Lomont primarily residential area that it has to qualify for. We'd have to do a service area. In the I, I heard there was a discussion. That, that these would be for the area around town of country. Oh, from CDAC? Yeah. yeah. I couldn't speak to that. I, I, that's why they come and do the presentation, because I feel like I'm always going to mess up whatever they're recommending gotcha. on that. Um, if that's how they wanted to do it, I mean, I could ask, I could send out an email and verify that and let you guys know if that's what they wanted. That would, I mean, I don't know if the mayor's office has anything on that. Uh, what were you looking for? To, to put one yeah, in. yeah. So the, the two north side intersections, I think, were uh, it was Robert Street and another street, and then uh, Shango Double Day were, were identified by BPD. The issue with uh, the area around town and country is the line of sight, the trees to get the signal up to I think, the state office buildings where they all are. But that wasn't an area that was identified. We were looking at some others that did, were not able to be installed because they were highly commercial areas. I know in the grounds your district, you're looking the Wall Street area, mm -hmm. we're trying to find a location that works there. Okay. Again, with the line of sight issues that we have at Robert Street, and also CDBG eligible. I, I know the chief would support that as well, so we're trying to work through Yeah, and then, I mean, I need to do more research on it before the final vote, but do you guys have any, I don't know, just because this is new, correct me if I'm wrong, this is new, but is there, is there like, Evidence about security cameras and what they do about deterring crime. I mean, is there is there evidence behind that? Is there? Well, I guess what was the rationale on this new budget lined up? That, that's one of the things that would get explained. We we viewed it as one of the strongest recommendations from the CDAC. In addition to again, I think a neighborhood group and you were working with that just wanted to see these funded. Um, you know, we they're expensive. The chief likes to you know add.
talking about is those um, kind of heat yeah. colored maps where they're showing different neighborhoods. You just have to keep in mind that there's a lag effect, right? So in year one, if there's crime and no camera, and in year two, there is crime and a camera, just because you see a plateau effect or even maybe a slight increase, that doesn't correlate to camera not working, right? Mm -hmm. Because many people don't know that the camera's there, right? And then number two, so you would need you would actually need like five to ten years worth of data of camera not there and camera there to actually say, you know, quarterly there there actually is a positive effect. Right? From a police standpoint, I would imagine, you know, license plates. Um, I mean, I know in the war, for example, in the first district, there have been a number of meetings where constituents at particular hotspots have actually asked for that. And I can even tell you just from two weeks ago, there was actually arrest that was able to be made from a drug thing that occurred near Glenwood, literally because there was a camera on someone's home surveillance mm -hmm. system that was able to pick it up and they were able to provide that video surveillance too. Yeah, I'm just curious about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a good question, I'm just saying. It may not be less crime, but it would be crime so Correct, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's just, it's yeah. just important Actually, to keep that Actually, it does work on Edward Street, because yeah. they know the cameras are there. Um, my second question was, Steve, you had mentioned with regard to the public service programming area that there's reporting that occurs. Correct, yeah. Um, how many times is that reported? Is that per quarter, per month? Is per year, it's the caper report. Just the one, month, right? Yeah. Okay. Is that like an end of year report or? Yeah, it's an end of year report. It's a snapshot in time. They look at everything we've done, the um, numbers of people served, um, just to see how we're doing. And the two big things they check is to make sure we don't exceed the cap on public services and we don't exceed the cap on administration planning. And my understanding is that if we do, uh, they will make us pay it out of the general funds as a general. Thank you, Steve. Um, question about the uh, the North Side Chow grocery store, the seventy five thousand. Is that so? I don't know a whole lot about the um, the business plan for this Chow grocery store. Is this likely to be a recurring? Uh, 75000 over a certain number of years, or is it just sort of like seed money for the first year of operation? Seed money at a capital. Yep. So this would not be, we would be running a continual check. Uh, but the city had committed to 150000 in uh, CDPG funding. And this is part of our uh, knowing that the project would be getting in line next year, part of the commitment, and then we'll uh, find the 75000 um, then another question, thank you for that. Another question I have. But I would say that I would rule out that in the future, uh, if Chow wanted to apply for the city's competitive pod money for human service money, for job training as associated with the store, um, I'm sure we would probably support that. And that's where we transition from a capital expense to a service expense, and then it gets into the right. Right. mix of the maximum you can spend on service program. Got it. And then the, uh, the other question is about the um, the twenty six thousand uh, dollars less in the mayor's proposed budget versus the CDAC proposed budget for senior housing repair program. Um, my question is: so we already, as I re recall, we already dealt with a um, a budget adjustment uh, this year to increase the allocation to that program um, and. My understanding from one of my constituents is that it has a pretty long wait period, like a four-year or three-year wait period, the senior housing repair program. No, that one's actually pretty quick. Is it really? They're, they're probably referring to our home repair, home repair program. Repair program. Repair program. Yeah. That yeah. one's got to wait. Yeah. The senior home repair program is actually very quick. Uh, we've updated it this year to make sure we're following HUD regulations. The extra money is being used not just for the regular expenses, which they normally do. I mean, these are things like light bulbs change, or fixing a railing, um, those can be approved within uh, 20 minutes of me getting the application. But they also are going for larger pro projects. I don't have the, I can't remember exactly which which one I've seen lately, but I believe they were doing like a porch <coughs> repair, which was going to cost like $5,000. Um, normally they do very small repairs. This additional money is enabling them to do larger repairs, but it requires extra regulation, uh, probably another week or two. 
but the proposed budget came in uh, today, not by Friday. Yeah, we were answering some last minute questions as related to the, the home side of things. So there were some regulatory questions that we wanted to make sure that I got answered in that. Um, even as of this morning, we were changing some numbers based on what would be allowed, what would not be allowed to release a show to the project. And I also know that I don't think it's being voted on until. Yeah, we have to have a public hearing. Yeah. So um, we, we want to make sure that our questions were answered. Questions or comments? Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And then, Joe, your home ESG, I assume that that's all. Yeah, good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And like I said, we'll get that in our units for that. Check move or I can see it, all right? Move or I can see it, all right? I talked about this back in March or April time period. And um, when we did the budget last year, we put in a $100,000 credit because we know we always fall short of not filling positions and setting up some of the salaries. And we reduced the budget. We put the $100,000 credit in last year. And this RL is basically balancing out that $100,000 bringing that negative 100,000 to a zero and reducing other lines uh, by $100,000 uh, in the budget. Questions or comments? Thank you, Chuck. Pick around 190-4111. 19111. Uh, last year's budget, we uh, proposed uh, Increase in retiree health insurance from 25 to 30 percent. We sent out a letter in, uh, you say, mid to late November to all the retirees, letting them know that um, we got a very strong uh, response. Uh, with them complaining about giving them a one um, one notice to take their rates from 25 percent to 30 percent. Um, at that time. We discussed it uh, with them and decided that we'd hold off to doing it until July 1st. Um, of course, none of them are excited about it going from 25 to 30%, but the biggest thing that they really wanted is to get it in the city charter. Okay? As of now, it really falls in my department's hands to make that decision and the mayor's. Okay? They really didn't like that. They really wanted it in the charter so that it has to come to council. You guys have to vote on it to raise it. Okay. I will tell you that the, the people we talked to are, are okay with this. We put it in the charter, taking it from 25 to 30. Uh, that's the most important thing. They're afraid that it's going to go from 30 to 50 in a very short period of time, which isn't the intention here. Um, some of the things that they don't truly understand, or they didn't understand, is in 2015, the cost of retiree health insurance to the city was $2.5 million, okay, actually 2.4, and they were paying about 824000 Altogether, it's 3.2, and they were paying about 824000 <coughs> In 2017, it jumped up to 3150000 and they were only paying 866000 okay. Um, so the idea of doing this was to help us capture some more of that money. What really happens is the people under 65 are the driving force behind this. Um, when they retire from anywhere from 45 to 65, they're the ones that are, who are self-insured. They're, they're the ones that are eating it. If you were to look at the reports, you would see that those numbers are phenomenally expensive. Okay, I mean, that's probably being fair to the population. Okay, they're the ones that are going to use it, but they're actually uh, the ones that are driving up the cost of health insurance to the city. Thank you. Uh, Chuck, when you say the, from 45 to 65, let's say um, I'll use the 20 year, like the police force can retire after 20 year uh, duty uh, uh, as a policeman. Uh, so let's say they get out when they're 22, they can retire at 42. Do, do they have that insurance from 42 right on up to 65? Or is it? So, the rest of their life. But it starts at the time of their retirement. Yes. Yes. 
and their dependents to get covered until they hit either 26 okay, or Okay, so the family spouse. plan is the same. Either single or family, they can have it either way. Right? Correct. Now, the, the uh, retirees that are at 65 and up, uh, even though they're being raised 5%, their, their actual premium is going down the way. So yes. We, uh, in 2018, the cost of their plan was $351. Uh, we hired a new consultant to come in and work with us on health care, and he got that reduced in November down to 205 for this year. So there was a huge savings for them, uh, which is the majority of the people. I think it's, there's about 100 retirees on the under 65, and there's like 412, I think, on the under 65. They saw a pretty good savings. If you take 25% of 350 versus 30% of 200, um, they actually saw a nice reduction in there. They actually more money in their retirement checks. So uh, to put things in perspective, let's say you're a 45-year-old family man uh, and you have a family plan, city health insurance family plan. Um, and what's the, without insurance, what, or what, what is the, the cost for a, for a person? For a person. With a family plan. Is it like 14000 16000 What does it cost in cities? Well, in which plan? We have the current plan. There are different tiers. I mean, for the retirement, it's almost all of you here. For all the under 65, it's costing us per retiree in 2018 $1,738 per retiree a month. Yeah. All right, so we're looking at 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 12. So 19, right? 19. How much was it? $1,000 what? $738. So out of that, if they're paying... Uh, That's our cost. That's the city's cost. It's $20,856. Right. So the retiree at 45 years old, family plan pays... About seven, seven, five hundred dollars. Don't have enough for those. Seven thousand dollars a year. No, they're not paying that. That's the problem. Um, I think they pay a total of it's less than four hundred dollars a month for family plan, which is usually four hundred dollars times twelve. So they're paying about forty. They're paying about forty-eight hundred dollars a year. Forty-eight hundred dollars a year. Yeah. The overall cost of that plan is about $25,000. Right. So if they're paying $4,800, that was before the increase? That is as of right now. Right. So, with a five, so the 5% five increase for the, for the retiree that's, that's paying the most, uh, it's going to cost them what? Uh, an extra $1,000 a year. An extra $1,000 a year. For my term. So, and that's high. Of course. I think it's like nine hundred dollars for a family plan. I think it's an individual that's about four hundred dollars. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good deal. I know. As a businessman, I know. Fourteen thousand, fifteen thousand dollars a year. And we get a very lucrative insurance plan. Uh, just a, a process question. You said that uh, you mentioned a couple of times that there were people that you spoke with about this retirees. What was the process you went through to uh, to find retirees to talk to to get a sense for? You know, you sent out, out a letter to every retiree. Say we're going to have a meeting to discuss this with them. Okay. So, and so it was an in-person meeting, and and, yes. just, and so that's where you you check the temperature. Of the temperature, the temperature that is very hot. Okay. <laughs> How many people showed up? I'm just curious. You go ten. I was going to say probably like fifty. I was going to say, I was gonna say at least a few dozen from what I heard. I heard it was fairly well. I was going to say thirty, forty, but yeah. fifty. It was so it was forty, forty. 40. 40. Yeah. And you said it was the temperature was hot, but you were you were characterizing this as you know generally well, um, well received this plan. But what were they hot about? Well, they were hot about the time, timing of it right before Christmas. Tell them instead of going to January, you know, 5%. Um, and the, the people that were over 65 were happy. They were seeing a decrease. And that's the ones that were under um, 65 that were under the past. How, how many under, are under 65? There's 100 people. There's 100 retirees under 65. And then there's 412 over. 
but we're talking about the future. We're talking about what this would be. What, what, what's what's the difference to the city? You know, four, three, four, five years. Schools continually going on. Okay. To give everyone an example of what could happen, um, not this past week, but the weekend before, um, the FDA passed a drug. It's called a biosimilar drug. Okay. Where someone that is born with a spinal disease, okay, has a normal lifespan of like one or two years, with a lot of medical bills.
hundred employees as follows. I really, really hate to sound like a lawyer here, but what defines eligible? That, that goes back to the collective bargaining agreements, and there's a section in 24 and 44 about non union employees. Okay, so there, there, there is a there are definitions. There's, of okay, all right, that, that's what I was wondering. Okay. Primarily the collective bargaining agreement, but Correct. I don't remember when, <laughs> since I've been here, we wrote in the non union part because right. that didn't exist. Yeah, I, I, I've seen that in. The, the respective bargaining union contracts that have come our way, I just, I, I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I didn't think it was a blanket thing citywide, but I just, so the respective bargaining units have a say so in that when contract renegotiations come up, so to speak, besides whatever's already. Right. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
our chemical composition, COD and TSS, COD and TSS, and even if those things are completed, we're not going to be hitting those limits until the full BAF is functional. So just because they have a built doesn't mean it's going to be operating. Chuck, why, why are they confident in those dates this time? I don't want to question their confidence, but obviously you've heard that line more than I have, probably. So why, I, I why are they confident for that? Confidence that they had last year. I mean, I don't get honest, the mayors are all about confidence. And it was past the meetings of the Jacobs, making sure that it was staying on board, uh, forcing the issues with the cash directors. Okay. I guess, I mean, I, I, I want to be confident. I was just um, at the plant last week, and uh, I guess from so many meetings I've heard that, you know, oh, this construction site's supposed to have hundreds of people on it, and now they're working all, all these extra shifts to get this done, to meet, you know, to make sure that we don't have to pay these fines and all this stuff and meet these dates. And I, I don't think I saw more than two dozen, maybe three dozen people maximum that were actual contractors working. And I, and I toured, I would say, the majority of that plan. Um, I mean, Charlie obviously was there, uh, he works there. I mean, is that, I never got to, to ask if that's a, is that a, is it standard to see that? Um, I mean, I, I was after that very worried that, that we weren't going to be meeting that August 31st date and that we'd have to be paying more and more of these fines into the end of 2019, into 2020. I mean, I, I, I guess from actually being at the plant, I didn't have that confidence that maybe the mayors have. So I, I, I hope you'll forgive me for, 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 for asking this question again, but, but what, was that indicative of, of what you typically see? Well, I encourage participation. There's people behind you who are there every day. And, you know, I, I would say that was a fairly typical day, maybe a little fewer, because it was just before the long weekend, so I think they knocked off a couple days extra. I can't say I'm not on the, in the bowels of the plant every day. But are they going to complete CN and magnification cells one through six by the end of August? I, I'm not a civil engineer, but I bet against it. And have the rest of them by the end of farther on. We're supposed to have them by June. We don't get update meetings. There's some that the trade goes to. By August, Charlie, by August 31st, we're supposed to have. DN cells one through eight online, all four DN cells, backwash waste tank, backwash treatment system, headworks, all modifications at headworks, primary clarifier modifications, and permanent CEPT system up and running, and UV disinfection, and the slow stickers done by August 31st. Unless they hockey stick to the productivity, it's not going to happen. The current rate, one rate, I don't see it, but I'm not a civil engineer. And, and Charlie, at the, at the last business meeting, when you came and spoke, you mentioned that they, that they had installed things against the manufacturer's recommendations. The manufacturer stated that that will cause future problems that obviously we'll have to pay to fix. And, and, and I'm... That I would caution too. Somebody should be looking at these, this work and either signing off and accepting it as acceptable or denying right. it well, not accepting well, it. Well, that's my question. Is, is this this August 31st date that they have confidence in? Does that include fixing the, you know, the very expensive mistakes that they made? All, all four of the, the influent valves for the city of Binghamton were installed backwards and they're the size of like a box truck. Uh, they're they're well maybe they they look that big at least from where I was looking at. Okay, well I guess I wasn't that high up, but <laughs> I, I didn't get the hug. They're huge. Anyway, maybe that's maybe a, a Tonka box truck. 
Um, but they're big. Um, and, and the thing is, we have to shut off the city of Binghamton flow to replace them. We can't do one at a time the way it's set up. Well, those were installed when they were bypassed in the well, well, the bypass pump. The bypass pump has been dismantled and removed from the site. Well, well, it's now being used. The only way you can turn those valves into the right position is to form back in the bypass pump and turn the water on. So it's not easy. <coughs> It says that there's other stuff 
attach and, and Charlie says he has attachments that, that might have should have been <laughs> so um, the other question was uh, well I mean I'm, I don't want to take up everyone's time trying to read those right now um, but so the the three separate fines the BOD, TSS, the phase one, the phase two. Um, to date, how how much have we paid out in DC fines for uh, for not complying with those three? We got to pay anything for the phase two. That's easy. That's zero. Okay.
this seems like it, it could have been anticipated. Was is this a lot of things that could have been anticipated? That were not. Okay. Well, I mean, who's responsible for paying for this if uh, if we do have to pay for some sort of mobile lab or some sort of outside testing uh, for a period of time? Do you have the sense? Outside testing, we can't send some of the samples because we know California has to be We're certified on those tests. It's the information we need daily. Yeah, you would have to have three couriers running to Syracuse. And the cost would be more than we have in our budget. <laughs> I don't think there's an off-site solution. So we're either going to have to come up with a trailer, which will be tough to get certified because it has to be very specific to the EPC basically has to come inspect it and say it qualifies as a site suitable for a lab. And will it fit on the construction site right now? Like, will it fit on site? Is there a place where, not knowing how big it is, you probably, I guess, could answer that. We have trouble getting our cars in here, so I'm not sure for a lab. Okay. Other questions or comments? Let's move on to the next one. The next one is uh, the board is asking for an increase in gas and heat quality of eighty thousand dollars. We are moving on to adjuster three, which uses a large amount of gas for the boilers, basically heating something foot around the thirty-five feet of water. So it is going to be a large increase in gas. We also have a new climate control of the TPS building, which makes it more difficult. So we would need additional. Questions or comments? You, you just said you want this to be expedited. Uh, so you talk eighty thousand to get you through the year, or is it yeah. is that a estimate, or do you think you're going to spend all eighty thousand? We haven't run any adjusters since I've been employed in the city, so I don't know exactly what it's going to
but I think we should have the consultant here that the city hired to look at the privatization. Bruce told me to answer the questions you're going to ask. You certainly have been entitled to ask him. I'm not telling you can't, but I'm sure you have a lot of questions that we can't answer. Well, I wasn't under the impression we were going to come to ask questions. I thought we were coming to get some information. True? Well, listen, go sure. ahead. You, sir, you're welcome to go ahead and tell me you can, but I think we should schedule this Bruce Tobin to come in in case you have questions we can answer. I think that that way we'll, we'll have a, a, a discussion based on both sides of, of the issue. I mean, I, we had a conversation with Bruce Tobey, but it was in a closed forum. It was a executive session at the JC uh, uh, Village Board. Uh, how long ago was that? Yeah, you were invited to the town. You're not prepared. Yeah. That's rude. No, no, no. no, no, no. I, 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 no, I'm no. You're, you're welcome to ask whatever you want. You're welcome to discuss whatever you want. I'm not telling you you can't. I just, if you want, just go ahead with it. We might not have all the answers. We probably don't have any answers. Yeah. That's what it's a problem. But you're still welcome to go ahead. Well, what information, what, what information do you have about these What's going on in terms of the request for proposals surrounding privatization? Uh, I downloaded the RFP from Press Connects. I still have not received any information from any owner, either mayor. There has been no directions to what's going on. We haven't heard that there's a plan. We haven't heard whether there's any Our retirees covered. We're getting questions we can't answer from employees. And just after the RFP went out, we started to get questions, and I brought them with me here. These people were asking us to basically do their work. Um, we got this many questions that they want answered by the end of the day on Friday. It should have been part of your RFP if that was prepared properly. So we're expected to answer questions so we can basically phase ourselves out in an extreme urgent situation. And we didn't feel that was fair. So we did our best. And some of them I spent a day to prepare, and then we get word, well, don't worry about it now. We've got a different answer. So we feel like we're getting jerked around. And frankly, I think the employees currently on the plan were totally disregarded in this whole process. And I realize you can't, you know, it wasn't hopefully your decision, but whose decision is it? Do we have a name who makes up a lead agency? Right now, I couldn't pick them out, and I'm not sure who's making the decisions. That concern is great. At this point, I, I believe the, the two areas are making the decisions. I'm not 100% sure on that. Maybe Jerry can address that question. Well, I think that the issuance of the, uh, of the RFP process, it was very clear that we were putting uh, Bruce Toby on to act as a consultant, and again, going to the strategy, the development of the RFP. Uh, what's included, what information needs to be gathered, but um, you know, certainly ultimately it's the two owners that have to decide on the future of the plan. But uh, we talked about with the uh, issues of who's ultimately responsible, I think, go to the structure, not the, the, the management from a personnel standpoint, but the structure of management that's been around for, for many decades. Um, so when uh, you're asked about the Option of looking at different management styles by someone in, from the process of bulletin. Uh, the answer and whether the uh, portrayal of that was, was accurate or not, um, I'll say that uh, having to say the fait accompli is certainly not our intention, but also understanding that this is the latest and sort of a long process which City Council has been involved in. I think it was January, if I'm not mistaken, when there was a joint meeting with Bruce Toby. And I also agree with, with uh, Councilman Scanlon and you know, Charlie and, and Craig certainly the need to, to be asking these questions. I just think that Bruce Toby was the, the one person that we need to answer a lot of about the scope and the strategy that type of thing. But doesn't it seem like the city's come to a decision without consulting anyone when they go when when you go out for an RFP? Doesn't that no. I do not 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 a decision in terms of not a decision in terms of, you know, what's the exact structure, what company are we going with, all that, all that, you know, detailed information, but in terms of, you know, we're not telling anybody that works at the plant, 
what's going on. We're not telling city council that we're going out for an RFP, and this is these are the details of the RFP. It's just like you know, we are soliciting proposals for the privatization of a sewage plant, and it, and it does to to maybe not to the mayor or to you, but certainly to the outside spectators seem like the cities come to that conclusion, especially when that's supported by an article where the mayor's quoted saying that, you know, however you want to characterize that. So I would say the city council was at the January meeting. I was not at that. I think members of city council were there, correct? It was an executive session. Okay, so I was not there, so I can't, I can't discuss the details a little bit more in regard to no. But I think that in issuing an RFP, you have to see what options are available. And I think everyone would agree at this table that the management structure is unique to New York State, has been had a history of issues as it relates to transparency, as it relates to accountability, who's held accountable for different things with a sort of a nebulous board structure. And we need to look at with the state of the art facility a different way of thinking about management. And that doesn't have anything to do with the police who work there. It has to do with the government structure when it was uh, when it was originally developed. And this is a process. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely a process. And I think that uh, the same way that the, the paper writes about the developments happening uh, downtown, saying that Ukabar will be coming to State Street. Ukabar is not coming to State Street. They've withdrawn their application because it, it needs approvals. It needs feedback, just the way that uh, any RFPs need to be approved by city council. Mm -hmm. That process is yet to happen. Uh, but the idea that um, we have a plan in place that's not being communicated is it's not the case. The plan is to see the options. So it also does, doesn't figure with what the mayor said on Bob Joseph. I mean, like, I didn't. I, I, I could, could I could. What did the mayor say on Bob Joseph? I, I mean, he, he what the mayor said on Bob Joseph. Uh, confirmed what was quoted and uh, what he was quoted as saying in the press connects article. Yes, he, he, he believes that the new management structure is needed. It's what he believed in 2013 when he when he ran for office on this very issue and this is what he believes today. But but we can, you know that I agree with you on that. You know what, you know what, I can agree with you, with you on us reevaluating management structures. You know I can agree that, that maybe having the politically appointed sewage treatment board isn't the best way to manage the plant. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've all agreed on that, but, but that's, I don't, I mean, we're talking about privatization. That is the topic of conversation. The private management, correct, for the plant. I don't know. Private, private, private management team, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, or the, the city and Jeff City for the owners of the plant, right? Just the city, they're the owners of the plant. Sure. Right. Right. Yeah. No. I mean. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is this is a, the process. And again, Bruce Toby can speak a lot more. And I'm going to go back to him about the way this has been done in, in other communities. The way that the city uh, in Johnson City should be looking at it, advice that he would give, as well as answer any questions. Uh, one of the things being made clear in the RFP is. Show us how you're going to retain employees at the point. That's one of the, the issues that needs to be addressed. So is is the mayor or yours or whomever's issue with the politically appointed sewage board? Is it with the actual management at the plant itself? Is it with the employees? Construction? Is it with yeah, is it with the, I have a lot of issues with the construction. Is it with, like what what they're you're characterizing the, the issues with management. I just, I, what are the mayor's issues with management? You have a brand new facility, right, that needs to be managed properly. We need to evaluate ways that that makes the most sense for the ratepayers. This is one of the ways that that's being explored. And based on his experience uh, in government and talking about the structure over a long period of time, which is no one's fault in this room, uh, that a new direction it should be very seriously looked at and that one that you support. But the mayor is just one piece in all of this. The mayor of Johnson City, the trustees in Johnson City, this council, and that's what I think was very important as well. And I said the mayor was the, the one was out there, but Bruce 
Kobe is another person that's, that's very critical in this process, and was hired by this council and the mayor in the village to guide us through this process. Kyra, I, I would, as I sit here, I mean, I don't know if anybody at this table will speak for myself. I have made any decision on this yet. We have to wait to see the process go through before, at the end, is it, does it make sense to hire a private firm? Does it not make sense? I, I don't need it. We don't, we don't have any to talk about. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of discussion going on here, and a lot, there are about a lot of heads, too. But we have to wait and see what the process is, uh, if it makes sense. I would caution that the privatization is not gaining accountability, we're losing it. And if you look at any of the failed, you know, go home and just Google it failed privatization of wastewater. The first one that comes up, they privatized, they lost accountability. The city owners then have to hire people to audit them and maintain control over them. And that was the complaint. The citizens lost accountability. You're setting up the homeowners here for a monopoly. Privatization works when people have choices. Where the airport is private, this one's municipal, I can go to the cheaper one. People are hooked into this system. They have no control or no say over the market. They have to take the privatization. That's not going to help them. Yeah, but throughout the years, uh, Charlie, with the, uh, a lot of mismanagement in the, in the last two or three decades, what say did the rate payers have when, when their rates went up? They their elected officials who should have been keeping an eye ten on the years ago, ten, 10 years, years ago, they went up 50%. Not ones now. Nobody was looking at the construction when Johnson City was the lead agency and they shorted the rebar. Who was on site every day? Was the production manager's office on site 40 hours? No. They were spot checking and the people doing the construction said, yes, yeah, fine, we're good. We'll have that deadline. Nobody checked in. We're going down that same road, and it's we are. scary to we are. the point. We're going down the same road. I think Privatization is not the same mistakes are being made again. Because we're just letting you know. The company that comes in and operates is going to say, well, you gave us a plan that has effective capital infrastructure. That's your problem. So you're going to pay for it again. That's not going to help the rate payer at all. It's still part of your sewer fund. Are the, are the risks of, you know, that are associated with um, with privatization made more or less severe by waiting until the plant comes online, like the new uh, the new systems come so online. Why I can tell, I actually did some research here. There's three types: design, build, operate. You hire somebody private that goes in, designs the plant, builds the plant, and operates it. That's one system. That's not what happened here. There's a design, build, own, operate, transfer, where somebody designs the plant, builds it. They own it until it's operational. Once it is operational and working, then they turn it over to the municipality or they run it. They go either way. Again, you didn't do that. I don't see any case where somebody is asked to come in and privatize a plant before it's completed. How would they give you a meaningful number? And what happens when they come back and say, oh, we've got another cost overrun. We're not going to hit these deadlines. Well, these are questions for Mr. Toby. When we Mr. Toby do. doesn't run the wastewater treatment plant. I don't think you would have the answer. She'll say, well, wait and see until the proposals come in. That's well, we need, to, we need to hear more voices on this. Thing. That's all. You should be hearing from your production crew. You should be hearing from Jacobs. There should be That's market right. updates. They should say, we're missing these deadlines. Who's doing the market yes. reports now? I understand yes. Jerry Nice yes. yes. and Jacobs, and now we're losing Ryan Lake. We're going to get fined again because nobody's submitting the monthly reports. Those are obligated under the consent order by the DPC. This is the kind of things when you point these out and say, well, we're not your own business. You shouldn't be doing this. You don't know this function. We're very frightened because we care about the public. We care about the public health in the river. We care. We fish. We live there. We're members of the community. And I don't think anybody in this room has ever said, I don't want to be a municipal employee anymore. I don't like civil service. When I took this job, it was because I just wanted to work at a wastewater treatment plant because it sounds nice. We care. We're going to bring in people who don't care. If they say, here's case in point, seasonal, your wastewater or your water treatment plant dumps the sludge to us. We have to shut down facilities to accommodate that because it would plug, it would fill up the DAFs. If you've got a private firm in there and they say, no, no, you can't submit that because that's not part of it, except in discharges, what are you going to do here? You just look at putting your own sludge plant in there, decided that would cost way too much money. What are you going to do? 
But they have to say, well, we could run this cheaper without freedom of living because they could have put a lot of X in here. We're private. We don't care if we're not really. We're just going to not accept that. Greece. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there's. You know, you're giving a lot of scenarios here, Charlie. We, we need more Somebody answers. Somebody should be looking at scenarios. Well, yeah, that's, right. that's what you're we're going to do. There's nothing, there's nothing on the table. There's nothing on the table right now. That's what we're going to do. Well, do you see any legislation? I didn't see any. Okay, okay, okay. 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 What I'm saying is we're going to be getting a lot more. What do you mean it's out there? I don't understand. When the mayor says we have dysfunctional management, privatization is in it. And that's the first we hear about it, as long as the headline in the paper is like, holy crap, the phone's ringing. People say, hey, look, am I still employed? What's going on? Oh, I don't know. Mr. President, yes. uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly in that there, you know, there's not there's not a proposal in front of us, so we have to wait until there's a proposal in front of us to understand everything. I totally agree with that. With that being said, you know, the 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 inform the RFP does exist. You have our employees are at the plant. They're just worried about their jobs, and um, and they're also worried about the future of this plant because because they because they want the best for it. So you know, as yes, we do, as we do too. So um, you know, we we don't we don't have to get heated with it. They're just asking questions, and 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 I think all seven of us are frustrated that we can't answer them as well as we probably want sure. to. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Right. And I know uh, Councilman Paris here have been frustrated with this plan since we started eight years ago. Yeah. And I think it's there before. And it's been nothing but a nightmare. So hopefully we can get some answers. And I think we ought to have more people in here to talk yeah. about it. And I think Bruce told me wouldn't be a bad, maybe he can't answer the questions either. And he may do the same thing that Charlie just said. I don't know. But I'd like to get him here. Yeah, find out. Maybe you can. Council Livingston? I'd like to make a suggestion, just given how complicated this is and how, I mean, I, I get that the, the RFP is just a proposal and, you know, the bids come in and, I mean, I get the process and that, that nothing is written in stone, but given how fast that process would go, if it, you know, if we decide to, to pick one of those, I think we should commit to, uh, to having somebody come in um, on a, you know, over the next few work sessions, Bruce Toby, somebody from Jacobs, you know, so that we and also our project manager, is that is that his his title? You know, once he's well enough to, to come back to work. Um, because I think that if if there's a chance that this this plan is gonna go, we've got a lot of information, a lot of questions that are completely we're completely in the dark about, and I keep hearing, you know, conflicting things from uh, people speaking about it in the public, um, people from the mayor's office. Um, I mean, for instance, the the, the comment about this being a, a, a brand new, you know, state of the art uh, facility, um, it seems con it seems to conflict a little bit with what I'm learning about uh, about what the state of the art is that that it actually the process that we're going to have in place in the new plant is going to look a lot like a uh, process that a lot of our operators are familiar with running. Is that? Yes, we, we ran a BAF, very simple. That was state of the art at that time. Lots changed since 2001. It's very, very similar to what we ran last time. Different vendor. And right now we are going through all the training, a lot of training. The owners are paying for our training right now. And one of the individuals who just gave us some training um, completed his training and made a statement before he left. Training last month has been a pleasure. You both and your staff are among the best I've worked with. Thank you for engaging and involving and encouraging your staff to engage as well. Do you feel like the staff that we currently have right now are capable of operating? We're experienced. We ran them. He could tell as soon as he started training. We were we were asking advanced questions. He knew at that point that he had experienced staff. The 
is part of the VA. It's very simple. And hopefully it's built better this time. That's what we're worried about. And that's what the owners should be worried about. We don't want to end up where we were last time. That was huge. It was a huge hit for the community. Four. And, and just a, a question about the also the infrastructure. From what I understood, the uh, only half of the buildings on on site are going to be new buildings, and about eighty percent of the infrastructure is going to be new. But then uh, a lot of the infrastructure was, was sort of so torn, the torn out. Some of the structures are original. It's all yeah, um, and that's be a rehab. <coughs> so there's a mixture of rehab and new. There's not a brand new facility. There's a difference there. Brand, brand new is breaking ground. Everything's brand new. That's not the case here. We're building a 20 acre facility. Uh, That's all. Yeah. Sorry. I just want to say something about the staff. experience we've went through a lot there flood of all six recovered from that the amount of work was astronomical to get that plant back up and running then that's when the BAF project was under construction so a lot of that <coughs> equipment was damaged and the flood had to be replaced new plant comes online. There was issues with it. I don't have to go into detail with it. I think a lot of you people in here know what the issues were with that facility. In fact, there's a lawsuit going on right now, which I'm not at liberty to talk about. We made it work. Um, there was an individual from Virginia Tech that come up to look at what we were able to accomplish with that system, he was amazed we were, we were able to run as long as we did. And meet permit. We didn't meet permit every month, but we did meet permit with it. Then there was a catastrophe with the wall. We kept running it. We kept on running it, and then there was issues with some other cells structurally that they, they thought were unsafe, so we took them offline. We kept running it. Then flood of 2011 hit. That was even worse than 2006. So we went right back to work, started pumping out the buildings, getting our settling tanks cleaned out, getting things back online, and got the plant up and running again. That's the kind of staff you have there. They're hard. Been through a lot, so. With that being said, we went through all this construction, and it hasn't been easy trying to keep that plant running because just about every aspect of that process has been compromised in one way, shape, or form. And we've been able to meet permit. Our permit is very under consent order. But we have a busted permit once with all that construction going on. And we've been walking around in the mud and the ice and the snow. Everything's temporary. Um, our, 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 our storage capacity for our chemicals. I mean, we, we, we take so many deliveries because they my, my storage capacity isn't there anymore. So we can't run out of chemicals and we never have. So we were just getting to the point where the employees were starting to feel good about this project, starting to line down, and wanted to get back to full treatment, seeing a nice effluent. And everybody was optimistic, excited.
questions or comments? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Greg. You. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just on the